Yes, Mark, will you open us in a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time of the year. We're so beautiful. Let us understand the beauty of God today as well in all of our lives. We commit this time in our lives to you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, so today the title of my lesson is God's Spoken Word. And just to note that all scriptures are from the New American Standard Bible, unless otherwise noted. So I'd like to read from Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11. The Word of God says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So the Hebrew for the word word is dalbal, which means speech, word of command, saying, speak, or talk. So let's look at verse 10. So verse 10 says, again, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So the word that God speaks to you it could be a scripture given to you. It could be a scripture given to you by someone else. It could be a scripture that during your time in the word is quickened in your spirit. A word from God on something you are to do for yourself or that someone else is to do. That word will go from a seed being planted into you to a sprout, to a plant being rooted to bearing fruit. Which, if you look at verse 10, it says, making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So when I taught, I think it was a couple months ago, about abiding I use the verse from John chapter 15, verse 5. And the word of God says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I mentioned during that time that the Greek word for fruit is karpos, which is the same word that is used in Galatians 5, through 23, which says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we need to ask ourselves, is the fruit of love? being produced in my life is the fruit of joy being produced is the fruit of peace is the fruit of kindness and go on through the list now you may be asking yourself what does that have to do with isaiah 55 10 through 11 what does that have to do with god's spoken word <laughs> the only way that god's word can accomplish what he wants which in verse 11 it says which goes forth from my mouth so he's saying from his mouth from god's mouth it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what i desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So God is telling us in the Old Testament that whatever word he speaks to us, it's not going to come back without producing something. And the only way that it can accomplish what he wants or 
bear fruit is by our obedience to what he tells us. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2.10 tells us that God has prepared works in advance for us to do so that we would walk in them. Not that I want you to occasionally walk in them or, you know, just when you feel like walking in, in them. God tells us that you would walk in them. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 9 and verse 12 Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, so the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, God may not, or maybe has not appointed you as a prophet to the nations, But before he formed you, he has appointed you to something. And we know that from Ephesians 2.10, where God says that he has prepared works in advance. So that means before he formed us, he prepared works in advance for us to do so that we would walk in them. Verse 6 in Jeremiah chapter 1 goes on to say, Then I said, Alas, Lord God, Behold, I do not know how to speak. Now, who does that sound like in the Old Testament? Moses. Moses said the same thing to God when he had the encounter at the burning bush. For I do not, I am not eloquent in speech. You know, pretty much I get all tongue-tied. Jeremiah is saying the same thing. Behold, I do not know how to speak. Because I am a youth. The excuse I don't know how to speak because I am a youth. And looking at that scripture, it does not tell us exactly how young Jeremiah was, but he must have been young enough that he thought, I can't can't go out there and be a prophet to the nations. Verse 7 goes on to say, But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Verse 8, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Verse 9, Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Verse 12, the last part of the verse says, For I am watching over my word to perform it which goes back to what it says in Isaiah chapter 55, that my word will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So he tells us that in Isaiah and also in Jeremiah, that he watches over his word for it to perform. God has given works fitted uniquely to us individually. We are not too young, we are not too old, we are not too this, we are not too that. Whatever, whatever, if you have ever said an excuse, Lord, I am too whatever, you aren't. In establishing those works, God has given each of us different skills, abilities, and talents to accomplish these works. In Jeremiah 1.12, God tells us that he watches over his word to perform it. Also, in 2 Timothy 1.6, and this is from the Jerusalem Bible, you have in you a spiritual gift, which was given you when the prophets spoke and the body of elders laid their hand on you. Do not let it lie unused. Now, I found that as I was preparing for the Sunday school, I went back because I had to look something up, and I ran across this verse that I think I used it back in January. But I thought, how appropriate. Like, God has given us each different skills and abilities and talents to use to perform the work that he has already established for us to do, 
He says that he watches over his word to perform it. He also says that his word will accomplish what he desires, not what we desire, what he desires, and that it will do what he sent it out to do. So I thought about last week, Kevin talked about the parable of the sower. And we can find that in Matthew 13, verses 4 through 8. So by, there was some seed that fell by the roadside. So God speaks his word to us. Are we going to be, as in verse 4, that as the word goes out, things immediately come along and take that word away? Or are we going to be as in verse 5? God speaks his word to us. It falls where the ground is rocky and there is hardness, such as maybe anger, pride, bitterness, hate. And because the word is not able to root, it dries up. Or are we going to be in like Verse 7, where God speaks his word, it begins to grow within us, but then the thorns or the cares of this world, such as fear, anxiety, worry, jealousy, choke the word out and is forgotten. Now, I've talked about before that we are going to have emotions. We are going to feel emotions because we are human beings. But there is a difference between walking in those emotions or those feelings on a daily basis versus feeling the emotion and immediately handing it over to God. There is a difference between the two. And that difference is you're either walking in the spirit or you're walking in the flesh, which we find in Galatians 5, 16, the word talks about walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, the desire of the flesh. You may say, but I don't desire to be fearful. I don't desire to be worrisome. I don't desire to be anxious. Our flesh is of, like the devil wants us to feel that way. He wants us to walk in the flesh because when we are walking constantly in our fear, when we are walking constantly in our anxiety, when we are walking constantly in our worry, we are unable to walk in the word that God has given us. Because like in verse 5 and in verse 7, even verse 4 in Matthew 13, if we are walking in the flesh, either the word is not going to be able to take root, or it is immediately going to be swept away, or it's going to be choked out. Or we can be like someone in verse 8, where we are cultivating our soil daily with God and his word and prayer and thanksgiving, spending time with him. And the word that God speaks grows strong, deep roots. Things come along. Life happens. Feelings are there, good and bad. When life happens, good and bad. But we remain grounded because we are not giving in to the flesh. We are giving in to the spirit. We feel it. We call it what it is, and we walk in the Spirit. So I would like to tell you a story about a tree. And this tree was planted by scientists in a dome. And these scientists created this dome that was the perfect environment. They planted plants, they planted trees, perfect environment. They thought this is going to be great, like just perfect. One day they came in and like the plants grew, 
the tree grew. It grew tall. It looked healthy. But one day they came in and it had fallen over. Well, how can that be? It's the perfect environment. There's no wind to knock it over. How did it fall over? And as they began to look, they discovered that the tree toppled over because it did not have any wind stress from the outside environment. It needed the wind stress to help grow its roots deep and strong so that when the wind did come, it may move a little, but it didn't topple because the roots were deep. They were grounded. So you may ask, why is all of this important? You know, you're talking about God's spoken word, but now you're talking about roots that are being deep. How does that deal with God's word? Because in life, we will have wind stress. And we need deep roots in order for God's word to accomplish what he desires in us and through us. For his word to succeed in the matter for which he sent it. Wind stress in our life. Troubles that may come. Situations may arise that you may say, God is not in this. Things happen in our life because we are in this world. In the word of God, it says everything, God takes everything and works it together for the good of those that love him. So he takes that wind stress and he uses that, that as we are in his word, as we are in times of prayer, as he speaks to our heart, as he speaks to others who then will speak to us, we are then able to take all of that and it begins to sprout and grow down deep and deep and deep and deep until when the wind actually does come, we're moving, but we aren't falling over. So, in Psalm 1, Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, the word of God says, He will be like a tree firmly. I love that word, firmly. I was reading over this this morning, and that word just popped out at me, firmly, which means securely or solidly fixed in place, or not easily moved or disturbed steadfast. And we see that in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 that God tells us that he will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is steadfast, those whose mind is firm, those whose mind is in unwavering. Does that mean that you aren't going to have a feeling of anxiety or a feeling of fear? Like for me now, all of this talk about going back to school is, creates a little bit of anxiety within me, a little bit of fear. But I have a choice that I can either continue in those emotions and continue to walk in my fear and what's going to happen, how's it going to look, you know, all the unknowns. You just don't know how things are going to look in the fall. Or I can walk in the spirit and say, no, your word says, da, 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 to create a steadfastness within my mind so I am not moved. Because when we are able to control our environment, we think that things are good. We think that we're growing strong and healthy. But then when something comes along, like going back to school, that could like really shake me and make me topple over. But if I believe and know down deep where the root is strong and has grown into the water, then I will know that God is in control of all situations. So no matter what comes, it's going to work out for my good because I love him. The word in Psalm 1, verse 3 goes on to say, He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. 
and in whatever he does, he prospers. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8 says, Thus says the Lord, his word going out. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. There we are, walking in the flesh. And whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Verse 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. And it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Like a tree planted by the water. That water is the living water. How Christ in John 4 at, with the woman at the well, and even Kevin mentioned the man at the pool of Beth Bethesda, that that water is the living water. So when our tree, our tree, is planted by the living water, it is going to grow roots that are going to grow into the living water and be able to be firm and secure and steadfast and unwavering, walking in faith, walking in love, walking in peace, walking in joy, walking in kindness, walking in goodness, walking in the fruits of the Spirit. In the beginning, I mentioned that the Hebrew for word is dawball, which again is speech, word of command, saying, speak, or talk. So let's look at Isaiah 55, 11. The word of God says again, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. Can you imagine? This is God talking. God saying, so shall my word be that comes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So let's look at a few examples in the word of God where this happened. Isaiah. So I have been reading in Isaiah and in our Monday night Bible study, we actually did like a um, research on Isaiah. Isaiah was not given a very good mission. The work that God had planned for him was to let Israel know that they were not being so good. So just imagine being Isaiah. And just imagine knowing that you are going to have to go out and say, like, this is part of the work that God's chosen for you to do, to let people know this stuff. You know how Isaiah 58 starts out, cry aloud, do not hold back. Let the people know of their sin. Isn't that a great mission? Like, wouldn't you just jump for joy if you had that mission? Isaiah needed to be deeply rooted in God. If he were not deeply rooted in God and in going out putting forth that word, sometimes that word was not accepted. And probably people were not very nice to him. So if he was not deeply rooted in God, just imagine how he would have been as a prophet. Oh, maybe, just maybe God's going to do this. You know, if, you, if Isaiah had been like that, he would have been going more towards the flesh and saying things that everybody wanted to hear to make their controlled environment perfect. But that was not the job that Isaiah was given to do. If we look at Moses, 
I love the story of Moses. So I'm going to be reading from Exodus chapter 4, verses 2 through 9, and also Exodus chapter 7, and I have on there 8 through 21, but I'm only going to read to verse 13. The word of God says, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand, and he caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Verse 5. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So the Lord told Moses, this is what you're going to do. When you go there, this is going to happen. This is what you need to do. And when you pick it up and it becomes a staff, it's going to happen so that they may believe. The Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. This is why I love Moses, because you know, God right here has shown him two um, extra extraordinary things that he can do as God of the creation. And Moses is still like, but Lord, like I just don't have the words to speak. I am not eloquent. And God's like, but I just, like I've show, I'm showing you this because it doesn't matter. Verse 8, if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, you see, it's like God was preparing Moses, if they will not believe you. God knew they weren't going to believe him. So in our life, when his word comes forth to us, he's going to give us little tidbits to prepare us. He's not going to give us the big picture, but he's going to give us a little bit just to prepare us for what is to come. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the wit they may believe the witness of the last sign. Verse 9. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So now let's go to Exodus chapter 7 and I'll read verses 8 through 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron. I love that, because God gave Moses a little blessing, because he just, because he was so insecure in his speech, he blessed him and said, Okay, I'll, I'll let Aaron go, like Aaron can talk for you. Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. Verse 10, so Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Verse 11, then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Now, could you imagine being Moses and Aaron? God has already told you, I'm going to do this. And then the sorcerers do the same thing. Like, maybe if you were walking in the flesh, you would be like, but God, like you told me that this was going to happen. Why is it, ha it happening exactly as you said? But we aren't done. Verse 12, for each one threw down his staff, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So when you go on to read to verse 21, it goes in about the Nile turning into blood. So everything that God had told Moses, the word that God sent out to Moses, it performed exactly what God wanted it to do. 
We see it with Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, verse 10 and verse 14, and also in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. Genesis 18, 10, the word of God said, he said, I will surely return to you. Now he said, that means God is saying this to Moses. I will surely return to you at this time next year and behold, Sarah, your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. So verse 14. So because Sarah laughed, God had to repeat himself again to Abraham. He said, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, the word of God says, Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. So I take that when it says at the appointed time, that that was a year later, just like God had said. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. We also see this with Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 through 14. Also in Genesis 6, 17 through 18, and Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. So in Genesis chapter 6, the word of God says, in verses 13 through 14, Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. Genesis 6, verses 17 through 18. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So we see here God's word that went out is, I am going because of all the stuff that is in the world, I am going to destroy it in all the flesh. So he takes it when we look, and he also said, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. So in Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 through 17, we see that the flood has happened, God has done what he has said, he has destroyed all mankind, and the covenant that he made with them was the rainbow. That whenever they saw the rainbow, that they would know that God was not going to destroy the whole earth and all that was in it again, and he has not even to this day. There are things that have happened that has destroyed life, but it has not destroyed the whole earth like it did then. We see this with the paralytic man in Matthew 9, 6 through 7. God says to him, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. So the man got up, took up his bed, and went home. We see this in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 39, where Jesus calms the storm. They're in the boat, and a fierce storm rises up, and Jesus is laying there sleeping. And the disciples are getting anxious because there's a storm. And they wake Jesus up, and what does he say? Hush, be still. And the wind died down. And so did the disciples. And it became perfectly calm. Hush, be still. There are many more examples in the Word of God when you read so many more examples. But I would like to give you a couple personal examples. When our family moved to Danville, there came a time, we moved in 1999, and there was a time that 
Kevin lost his job and he was looking for another job. And this happened in the year 2000. And this is why I encourage people to write things down and to date it. Because it's so important to date it because then you can look back and say, oh yeah, back in that. So I went back looking and on July 24th, 2000, during my quiet time, God spoke this word to me. I was reading, and when I came across this scripture, my heart jumped. It's in 2 Chronicles 11, 4, 11, verse 4. This is from the New Living Translation. Go back home, for what has happened is my doing. Go back home. As soon as I read that, I knew that we were supposed to come back here. Now, this was in July. We did not move back to the area until December 31st, 2000. Go back home. Kevin could not. We looked in Roanoke, where my dad and my aunt are in Roanoke, Virginia. We looked in Pittsburgh, where his family is. Could not find anything. Go back home. Also, in my life, that the verse Deuteronomy 531, on February 26, 2018, the Lord spoke this verse to me. But you stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. So on January 4th, 2020, Pastor Mark texts me to, he asked me to teach that, he said, God said that you had something to share. So because Pastor Mark obeyed the word that God put forth to him, I was able to then obey the word that God had put forth to me. So we do not know that when we obey the word that God gives us for someone else, we don't know what's going to happen. When we obey, someone else is able to obey. God's word accomplishing what he desires and succeeding in the matter for which God sent it is the Holy Spirit having his unhindered way with us. So in closing, I would like to share a word from the Lord that I received on February 13th, 2018. Stop using excuses to not do what I have told you to do. It is a lie from the pit of hell. Cover yourself and stand firm. Gird up your loins. I came that you might be free and have life everlasting. Have no fear, for I go before you. The way has already been made. You need to go forward on the path that has already been prepared for you. That is all that I have. Be blessed. Thank you.